Welcome everyone. I'm Heather Farrell. I'm the curator and director of exhibitions at Burlington City Arts. And with us today is Bradley Borthwick. How are you, Bradley? Hi, very good, thank you. Nice to be here. Oh, it's lovely to have you here. Um, it's, it's still early days in the exhibition, but I think it's a perfect time to have this program and to learn more about your artistic practice and your work. Um, but before we get started, let's give everyone a few more minutes um, to join us in the world of Zoom and busy lives and afternoons. Uh, and so while we wait, uh, I just, how are things over there in Maine? You got any snow yet? No, we have had uh, some frost, which has been uh, kind of nice, actually, in the mornings. And that's about it. Uh, you know, I think we are, um, we're up here now for about a week of good weather, uh, according to the report this morning. So, um, but uh, yeah, no, season is changing. And uh, I, I, I look forward to some snow. I think it would be nice. Um, it, it, you know, that time of year is always good for um, feeling productive you know, kind of, kind of insulating to get back into the studio. Right, into the studio, working away. And do you have a studio, because you're at your home right now, do you have a studio at your home or is it in a different location? The studio is in Brunswick, Maine. I live in the mid coast with my wife and daughters. And um, I have been working from home a little bit this past year, uh, just setting up in, in, you know, like the basement mm -hmm. of sorts, um, carving marble and whatnot. Um, it's been nice just to, you know, not be back and forth as much, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's, um, I, I know from earlier views, you're, it's, it's a really lovely view out, out those windows with the, the forest and the trees. Yeah, it's, um, I guess it's quintessentially Maine. I mean, other than we, we, we can't see the ocean, I guess that would be even better, wouldn't it? Yeah. Not, not quite there yet, <laughs> so. But yeah, no, surrounded by big old white pines and, uh, you know, just, uh, I don't know. Um, it's, it's really quite lovely. You know, I mean, to be honest though, the drive up to Vermont uh, two weeks ago was equally as beautiful in this time of year, especially. Right. Oh, you know, definitely. Fall, fall color. Yeah. So I know I can't believe it's, it's already been two weeks and the show's been open. Uh, geez, not even that long. Um, but we're really thrilled to kind of introduce the work today and, and maybe this is a good point to kind of uh, dive back in and hopefully a few other people have been able uh, to join us and to start with our program. So I'll do a quick introduction again. My name is Heather Farrell. I'm the curator and director of exhibitions at Burlington City Arts here in Burlington, Vermont and thrilled to welcome Bradley Borthwick here today via Zoom uh, and um, would love to kind of give a quick overview of our program and the exhibition. So we'll make a few introductory remarks and starting with um, Objects of Empire, our exhibition. And in this exhibition, uh, Bradley thoughtfully considers the shared cycles of civilization. And he investigates the significance of two seemingly incongruent manufactured objects, an 18th century Vermont headstone known as the Pratt Tablet and an ancient Roman amphora. And for his BCA installation, he combines exquisitely hand-carved marble and cast beeswax reproductions of headstone and amphora with a rhythmic soundscape. And it creates this experiential exploration of memory, place, history, and cultural connection. And uh, it's, it's, we just had a staff tour uh, through there this morning, Bradley, and it always um, brings people into the space. It's very thoughtful as well as evocative of questions and notions um, that I'm excited to dive into more today. But before we begin, I'd like to share some notes on our, our format. And after my introductions, uh, Bradley will give a presentation on the evolution of a sculptural practice over the last few years, everything that led up to his commission project at BCA Center. And then following this presentation, we will be opening the program up to questions from you, our audience. And so please use your Zoom Q&A feature and pose your questions for Bradley, and then he will be able to answer these at the end of the presentation. There's also a chat feature, and we always invite people to share a comment, say hello. A reminder that today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted in about a week on our BCA website. 
to introduce Bradley, I first have to say we have been so thrilled to present your work here at the BCA Center for your first solo exhibition in Vermont, as well as in New England. And Objects of Empire, like most of your sculptural and installation-based work, is grounded in historical research. It's a reflective practice and where you, the artist, recreate vernacular motifs and ancient forms from remnants of past material cultures. And it's so fascinating how you move across global economies and histories and pose questions like, what is the connection between a place like Vermont and ancient Rome? Borthwick's work has been featured in solo exhibitions at the Arkansas Contemporary Sculpture Society in Fayetteville, Arkansas, the Hinterland Ga Gallery in Denver, Colorado, and Cornell University, Ithaca, New York. He has participated in group exhibitions at the De Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum in Lincoln, Massachusetts, and the Portland Museum of Art in Portland, Maine, as well as internationally at the Parco dell'Arte Serena Monferrato, Italy. In 2018, Bradley completed a residency aboard the Antigua, on which he sailed throughout the high Arctic archipelago of Svalbard, Norway. Originally hailing from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, Bradley currently resides with his family in Maine and serves as the Associate Professor of Art at Colby College. And with that, thank you again for joining us today, Bradley, and I turn the time over to you. Great. Thank you, Heather, very much. It's a pleasure to uh, be here and to um, join the BCA in today's talk. I'm just going to um, share my presentation file. And there we go. I hope everybody can see that. Um, and, and by the way, just an interesting personal note um, in your introduction there, um, hailing from uh, Hamilton, Ontario. I was born in Hamilton, Ontario, um, have no memory of it other than uh, visiting grandparents there. I grew up in a small town called Port Dover. Um, and apparently Port Dover is only a few degrees of separation from anybody else in the world for some reason. So for those of you who might be listening from Port Dover, thank you for joining. Um, and so here we go. Um, Object of Empire being the title um, of this exhibition. Um, and <clears throat> in terms of uh, objects and in terms of uh, notions of empire, I just wanted to uh, begin with um, some background. I have a few, a few works of mine from the past that I, I think are um, most significant to how this particular show for the BCA has come together. Um, this is an image of me from nearly 20 years ago now, um, actually a full 21 years ago, um, when I had um, returned to Canada after um, an initial uh, working stint um, from undergrad in, in the US. Um, I came back to Canada to work and to, to practice with a, a master carver, a Romanian by the name of Lawrence Voyedis, who had an atelier set up in Toronto. And uh, in the back alleyway, um, <clears throat> from the, uh, the row house where I was renting a room. I had a small garage um, and, uh, and uh, Mr. Voyetis uh, set me up with, with remnant blocks of stone and, and taught me all the basics. And so this is just a, a snapshot with a 35 millimeter camera um, with me and a few um, pieces carved and a few big blocks of wood and my chain fall and all the rest of it. Uh, just to say that um, this is kind of uh, my starting point um, prior to graduate school and graduate study, um, but very much the beginnings of, of my own personal uh, veneration of, of stone and stone carving. Um, <clears throat> I tend to look back through historical accounts, um, looking at precedent, be it um, ancient um, and even prehistorical, such as this uh, example on the left here from Neolithic Ireland, um, through to, um, you know, areas of the world where, where I've had the fortune to travel or study, um, always uh, traveling with camera and sketchbook and trying to make the observation, taking note of a given moment where a certain um, composition of parts or even a vernacular um, with respect to, to aesthetic or materiality um, might catch my eye. So uh, the Dean Village Court there in Edinburgh uh, where I studied um, all the way up to Orkney Island, uh, off the north coast of Scotland um, with this um, kind of, um, you know, uh, civic engineering um, installation of parts um, all the way through to artist precedent, um, such as Rui Chafes and Mimo, Mimo Palladino. Um, 
in a more um, kind of studied way, um, these, these placements of um, objects, of items, of um, everyday kind of use um, have always interested me. Um, and I've always wondered how the role of a contemporary artist might affect a given space, especially when we have um, kind of such precedent in history to look upon. One of the very first projects that uh, is still kind of near and dear to me um, involved a, uh, <clears throat> a trip to France uh, seeking uh, Mont Saint Michel, uh, this um, island citadel, this uh, 12th century cathedral built up on, on its own um, rock, essentially, uh, just off the, uh, the mainland coast of Normandy. A bit of a bucket list at the time. Um, I was just out of graduate school. Um, had studied uh, some of the details of how um, the Catholic Church was um, kind of using stone carving um, as adornment um, within this cathedral that is also open um, on its west side, more or less to the ocean. So this combination of, of, of um, trade in terms of stone carving, but also just the open effects of that Atlantic front um, on the masonry of that cathedral. Um, one of the interesting um, details of, of my approach to Mont Saint Michel was just in researching how to get there, just, just to travel there. And what I realized was that this, this whole complex, the idea of this island started in, in the uh, eighth century um, for the past 1200 years had been basically developed on the idea that, that as an island, it would, it would stay somewhat isolated, it would stay uh, under the protection essentially of these tidal mud flats that, that surround the entirety of the island. It's a church, it's a monastery, um, it's a small village. It's basically set up as one big fortification, uh, mostly for the holdings um, of that cathedral, it's an archive. And oddly enough, in the 19th century, uh, decisions were made to connect that island to the mainland with a causeway so that visitors could literally walk or drive uh, or you know, uh, ride a horse right up to the front door. And so for me, the building of that causeway um, essentially made the idea of that island citadel uh, moot and, and, it, and it, it, um, struck a chord, it kind of um, bothered me or, or um, just kind of saddened me in terms of, of how uh, one moment in the 19th century could kind of essentially erase many, many centuries um, of this other um, idea. And so I went there with um, an idea to address that span of water, that mud flat, uh, depending on the tide, um, that had essentially defined that place um, for over a millennia. And I basically carved these limestone skipping stones. Uh, this is back in 2006. Uh, the title of the piece is called uh, Dissension Act, Sage's Bridge. And I simply showed up, it was January, very few people there. Um, I ended up talking with one of the uh, resident monks up in the cathedral who gave me access down to that west side of the complex to this small landing um, on the rocks set up my camera and with several dozen of these uh, limestone skipping stones, each carved to fit my hand. Um, and they really skipped beautifully across that water. Um, I released them all out into that stretch um, of the Atlantic, of that, of that tidal flat. And ultimately I was just addressing the space that had held that island secure um, for so long. I was also addressing this um, turbulent history, often a violent history. There was a lot of uh, many, many several attempts to, to overtake that island. Um, and ultimately those, those tidal waters would, um, would sweep in and typically, you know, wash away anyone who was banging at the front door. <laughs> so, um, so this is just an example early on with um, minimal resources uh, with, with a fairly simple idea. Um, and this opportunity to, to travel to a specific site and, um, and just see if I could kind of set up and um, perform this, this task of throwing out these stones, um, even though I had no network, no connections, no authority to do so, um, just showing up and uh, making the attempt. Um, <clears throat> while in uh, Scotland as an undergraduate um, studying in Edinburgh for a semester, I had the opportunity to um, 
to travel up to Orkney, uh, this island chain north of the, uh, the north coast of Scotland. And on the Orkneys, uh, there are several sites that are essentially uh, Neolithic um, and even Paleolithic. Um, this is a, an example of the Ring of Brodgar. It's a standing stone henge. Um, everyone probably knows of Stonehenge down in the UK. Uh, this predates Stonehenge um, and is obviously in, in not the same type of um, remnant shape, but nonetheless, there is this beautiful rural kind of bucolic Orkney landscape with this ancient henge, uh, these standing stones. Um, and my time there, um, this is 1997, I believe, <clears throat> I simply rented a bicycle and um, made my way from Stromness, the, the port town, out to these various sites, um, and I would often be the only one there. Um, it's not the case anymore, of course, but um, it was really quite fascinating to be there. And I and I and I just had the time in the in the kind of the space to to think about these monolithic stones, how they were placed there, why they were placed there, um, how they might remain and age, um, and, and in a sense affect the, the contemporary viewer or you know the passerby like myself um, in a way that is obviously so very far removed from from anything to do with the original um, but yet still very powerful and so with that in mind um, many many years later I um, I had enough <clears throat> I guess I just had enough um, skill set developed um, and and kind of in terms of stone carving but also just conceptually um, through my graduate school education and, and whatnot, to, to go after this idea of a monolithic presence in a um, remote um, or somewhat romanticized landscape. This brought me to Ireland, County Donegal in the north of Ireland, um, the north of the Republic of Ireland, uh, to work with a, a stone carver there, a Redmond Herity. Uh, and the idea was to learn how to carve a perfect sphere perfect sphere as a monolith that I might then uh, locate um, in, in, a, in a distant uh, remote landscape. And so here's the uh, block of sandstone, local sandstone uh, quarry just outside of uh, Letterkenny, the town of Letterkenny, uh, this brownish orange um, sandstone on the, on the pallet. And for one month, I, uh, I learned how to reduce that big block of stone down into this um, perfect sphere. Um, measuring uh, 34 inches in diameter, um, the sphere was, was finished and um, transported up to um, this uh, rift valley, um, also in, in County Donegal. Uh, this particular rift valley extends through the North Atlantic and, and, and ultimately um, as a geological kind of feature and is what's um, splitting the northern um, part of the highlands of Scotland from some of the southern tier. Uh, it's a beautiful um, open landscape. Um, actually, my parents were there uh, at the time they were visiting. Uh, we literally rolled this thing out of the back of a pickup truck down this mountainside and into the bottom um, of the valley. Uh, this valley is essentially a peat bog. Um, and the report there from uh, Redmond about a year later uh, was that the stone had vanished. Um, and there was no way, uh, no means for, for that stone to be picked up by anybody, by any you know, vehicular access, or, or unless maybe you had a helicopter, but I highly doubt that was the case. Uh, and so the notion is that that peat bog um, absorbed, consumed this monolith that I hope will be discovered um, you know, in some future uh, millennia um, as things change. Maybe it will bubble back up to the surface for uh, for some archaeological find, I, I don't know. Um, but like those skipping stones at Mont Saint Michel, um, I started to recognize this uh, desire to create work that I could throw out there, roll out there, place there in the world uh, for some future connection. That first sphere uh, brought me to a similar idea, uh, a larger sphere, this time in marble, uh, another monolith um, based out of the Yule Marble Quarry in Colorado. I was living in Denver at the time and uh, could make the drive over to Marble, the town of Marble, um, and um, understand uh, what that resource was. Um, on the left, you can see the interior of, of one of the main chambers um, or um, 
theaters as they're referred to. Uh, this is how they dig um, or cut marble uh, vertically down into that marble vein inside the mountain. So essentially you're inside this beautiful kind of cathedral-like space um, inside the mountain. There I am uh, in my younger years with uh, the uh, stockyard of marble uh, down at the mill site. And then ultimately the, the 11 ton block that I had um, transported to a work site in Golden, Colorado. And for several seasons by hand uh, and with uh, one, one saw, cutting saw, um, I fashioned yet another um, marble uh, or another stone sphere. Uh, this one's quite, quite a bit larger than the uh, stone in Ireland and uh, measuring approximately 54 inches across, I believe. Um, to be returned to the marble quarry um, from where it was mined. And you can see these large blocks there being uh, stacked up along the floor of the quarry. Uh, my piece was um, unloaded, uh, of course, working with the, uh, the superintendent of the mine and, and a crew of workers and the big machinery. Um, we were able to place my, my, my sphere, uh, monolith slumber, the name, um, back up on this ledge into the quarry. And the idea here is that over time, as the uh, company keeps um, cutting down through that marble vein, uh, this little uh, ledge will remain and my piece will, will remain there indefinitely, if not forever. And so, you know, as that floor kind of is removed and, and they continue to cut down, uh, this sphere will remain somewhat um, perched up or, or um, kind of inaccessible physically, but certainly visually and therefore conceptually. Here's a, an image down um, through one of the, uh, the, the openings, the portholes into the mine. Um, that must be close to 100 or plus feet down to that little ledge um, where the sphere was placed. And so again, like the um, skipping stones at Mont Saint Michel, like the first sphere, uh, monolith perpendicular in Ireland that, that was um, absorbed by that uh, valley bottom, uh, this mine will be closed one day, right? It, it will be uh, fully excavated. Uh, the portals will be closed up. Oftentimes uh, water makes its way in or is pumped in. Um, all of this will become inaccessible and uh, it won't be utilized anymore. Um, and the idea is that, is that my sphere as an artifact will remain there for, for future discovery. All of this takes me to uh, some other opportunities that I'd like to just uh, provide for context here le leading up to the uh, Burlington City Arts Show. Um, travels to Europe again, uh, this time Rome, um, have a travel grant to, to spend a month or so in Rome and to um, study and sit with any number of um, kind of residual parts of the ancient Roman Empire. So we have this image here of the Imperial Forum and then all of these other details um, throughout the various um, theaters and, um, and institutional spaces of ancient Rome. Uh, I'm, I'm enamored by how these uh, remnant parts, often archae uh, architectural um, facade um, pieces, you know, uh, masonry blocks, carved details, um, <clears throat> just this kind of um, way that, that, again, in just two millennia or more, uh, what had been the face or the facade of the Roman Empire, um, so much of it laying in, in bits and pieces, um, kind of kind of swept to the sidelines of, uh, of these various um, forums. Um, also the way materials are reused. Um, that image on the left is a, is a building in Rome, uh, occupied, uh, currently lived in, um, and, and, and yet, you know, opposite that, that window, we have this, um, this kind of residual column that was pulled from another site and, and reused as part of that, that masonry system. Um, just again, uh, find all of these um, kind of ways of interacting with the past to be um, really very curious and intriguing. Um, just some um, simple little detail shots of, of me kind of foraging through um, the debris of Rome returning to my um, little rooftop uh, patio with um, drawings and glasses of wine and uh, thoughts pertaining to, to, the, to the day's finds um, and making a record. Um, also, um, in terms of um, spending time in Rome and addressing the archive, um, visiting the museums and the various inventories, 
that do um, actually kind of organize and catalog um, various parts of that ancient world. Um, that image in the top left corner there from uh, what's referred to as Fronten's Cornice, again, one of these institutional buildings of, of ancient Rome. Um, and we have this um, you know, remnant um, block of stone with this oddly pitted surface and, and all of these other details that, um, that are part of its architectural heritage through to these um, um, carved stones um, that are laid down into the paving in front of uh, one of Rome's many cathedrals, the Santa Maria and Ara Cueli. Um, and the effect of, of putting um, bas relief carving into the ground plane so that over time, everything is softened and um, kind of worn out by, by just the volumes of people um, walking through. So all of these details and all of these interests from my time in Rome led to a series called Artifact Displaced, where I carved in limestone um, various motifs discovered um, from all of that time studying the details while I was there. <clears throat> I'll just go through these um, quickly. Um, this is what called the dental, uh, the architectural detail known as dentaling, uh, this, this way of throwing relief, throwing shadow as part of the hierarchy of a, of a given architectural facade, mostly um, for buildings of significant institutional uh, buildings. Um, my take was to turn that dental, which is typically carved in a perpendicular fashion to the facade, I tilted it approximately 40 degrees into my slab of limestone um, in reflection of how I would see remnants of that dentaling um, just laying about in the Roman landscape, such as the image there on the left. Uh, this is uh, one way of taking the profile of a column base and stretching it along the dimension of my limestone, uh, this piece called base. Palm trunk, uh, you can see there the image on the left, this cylindrical motif of the bark of a palm tree uh, trunk. Um, these cylinders were often found as um, part of that architectural ordering, uh, the facade, uh, the carving on a building's uh, facade, sometimes as uh, support for figurative sculpture, um, often down, down kind of the bottom half of a, of a uh, statue's uh, right or left leg. And again, within the confines of the dimensions of my limestone slab, um, how to stretch that motif from left to right. Um, and actually just a very complex set of geometries that um, again, I found just fascinating in terms of stone carving. Uh, scroll, uh, this, this kind of framing of, um, of space that would then contain text typically. So almost like a message board, um, depending on its uh, use throughout uh, those um, architectural components of ancient Rome. Uh, mortis, um, so that stone on the left is original, just again, um, uh, remnant ruin in, in one of the uh, Roman fora. That square hole um, meant to receive a corresponding um, tenon or a, or a positive uh, piece in stone, um, simply as, as masonry, as building blocks. Um, and I would see these vacancies, these mortises um, throughout the ruins of Rome. Um, and I'm not entirely sure what attracts me there, perhaps just the kind of um, positive negative effect of that, of that mortise, just visually. Um, but I did want to reproduce it because of its um, occurrence. It, it, I, I, again, I, I saw it so often while I was there. In the context of this piece, though, um, I was considering um, the immediate environment of this beautiful uh, piazza with this uh, marble bench um, and the paving pattern um, of that piazza to, to help inform the, um, the field of carving around the mortise that I produced. Uh, the letter Q um, from within SPQR um, as part of the ancient Roman Empire's uh, an acronym for itself. Um, keep in mind, this is 2016, 17, so nothing to do with QAnon today. Um, and then this elevation marker. And again, those large masonry blocks that, that I could look down on in, in the ruins of Rome and these little crosshairs um, that masons would require um, to, to find their elevations 
um, so that uh, you know they were essentially on track as, as the blocks were being put up. I reversed that elevation by cutting away the, um, the limestone slab and allowing that elevation marker itself to be um, raised in, in proper relief uh, in this piece called elevation. So together, um, that collection of bas-relief carving um, in artifacts displaced um, became part of a larger group called Nero's Analog from 2019, where each of those limestone slabs were then placed onto their own easel. These uh, wooden easels are essentially designed and built to reflect a painter's easel, um, as a painter would, would um, uh, engage with uh, an outdoor environment. So plein air painting um, is the idea here, a portable easel, but in this case, having to be built in a way to support the weight of those stones. Um, and then as a collection <clears throat> in that uh, space of the gallery. A few images of Nero's analog. And with that uh, group of work, um, two kind of subsidiary um, bodies of work, uh, tabulae, uh, these beeswax tablets, which are created from that um, an initial limestone carving, the one that you can see there on the front easel, that palm trunk motif. Um, this beeswax rendering is the, is the inverse. Um, and then framing that pattern and being able to hang it um, vertically on the wall and have this dialogue exist between the replica in beeswax and the original uh, in limestone. Uh, keeping in mind, of course, that um, in this instance, if I can just go back a moment, um, beeswax itself is inert. Uh, it doesn't spoil, it tends not to change. Um, it only melts at high temperature, 147 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so in effect, the beeswax will remain uh, much longer than, than anything carved in stone, because as we know, stone will crack and, and crumble and, and ultimately uh, return to, to stone dust. Um, whereas the beeswax, you know, chances are will will remain. And so this is part of my play uh, when using and deciding upon material choices, um, if, especially if they're going to share the, uh, the given motif. And then the amphora, the introduction of the amphora in uh, my work. Um, this image on the left is from Pompeii, uh, just south of Naples in Italy. Uh, and these incredible storage facilities on the grounds of Pompeii where the archeologists of course are are stacking uh, their finds. Uh, and working from um, that experience um, and just images um, of that time to recreate my own sense of, a, of an amphora um, as part of the context of, of that body of work with, with Nero's analog. And just a detail there of those pieces, uh, beeswax and plaster together. Now, uh, a quick shift here um, from Rome and all of that study to, to the uh, experience I had in Svalbard, Norway uh, that Heather had mentioned, um, simply to, to provide some context in terms of how I'm starting to better understand where we are now, kind of who we are now as a, as a, as a uh, culture, as a civilization, um, and how it is I question where, where we are on, the, on our own kind of cycling um, in, in terms of the, the um, kind of the economy within which we thrive versus the um, kind of unsustainable growth that tends to mark the end of any given um, past civilization. So if I have ruins of Rome on the left, of course, there are a myriad of reasons as to why that particular civilization cycled down. My experience in the Arctic was um, providing some, some insights perhaps into our own um, cycling down. Uh, there you can see the Antigua, this three-masted ship. It's uh, 50 meters in length, if that gives you any sense of scale um, that, that we would be sailing through, um, through these fjords along the coast of uh, Svalbard. And while there, I was just being able to compare, compare my notes, again, from all of the debris of Rome to the to the debris that we would spend day after day picking up on these uh, Arctic uh, shorelines where there are no cities, no towns, no, no inhabitants, 
uh, just the the uh, the flotsam from from the ocean currents uh, bringing bringing waste up from from waters south um, to how certain forms of of um, architecture in a sense kind of uh, you know built form cultural form um, the way that it may in time um, kind of land back into the given landscape from which it was erected, uh, whether again it's in ancient Rome or here up on Svalbard with these um, washed up um, um, post and beams. Uh, again, that reuse of, of materials, that, that recycling um, that always fascinates me and, and how it is we tend to do our best, this kind of uh, economy of scarcity of sorts uh, in a given place. Um, provides these juxtapositions in form and in material. Uh, these symbols, um, that symbol on the left is, a, um, is iconic of the ancient Roman Empire, this um, central uh, figure of the eagle with this walled city um, surrounding the center of that symbol, uh, you know, connoting um, the idea of, of the empire, of, of the, the um, the kind of the, the expanding border of that empire. Uh, this wooden um, remnant is from a, a lapstrake uh, rowboat. Uh, it's the transom um, of a small wooden boat. Um, obviously that rowboat is no longer intact, but up there um, to find that remnant reminds me of that idea of expansion and exploration that is also signified by the Roman um, detail there. And of course, just in general, we just seem to have stacks and stacks of uh, material residue. <laughs> and, um, and of course, part of my experience in the Arctic was, was to witness um, the, um, the breaking apart of glacial facades um, in, in, in this kind of ongoing kind of population, we would call it. Um, you know, sometimes there were villages, sometimes there were cities of what are referred to as uh, bergy bits. So little bits and pieces of, of that glacial um, calving of those icebergs and ultimately what to do, right? And so the scale of the Arctic was something I've never experienced before, um, despite having lived in the Rocky Mountains of the West and uh, exploring the Northern islands of Scotland, the actual vastness of the uh, Northern uh, Arctic um, archipelago was um, kind of beyond me and still, still wrestling with that, um, this um, kind of this, the sublime nature of it all. So, so I had to kind of pull in the reins a little bit here and, and refer back to motif that I think was just more readily available uh, to me working as a sculptor. And, I, and I, I go back to the amphora, that image from Pompeii, and I introduce this new motif from Vermont uh, on the right, uh, the Pratt tablet. Um, and then in the middle, um, the use of this Olympia white marble that is uh, mined in Vermont. And so how can I work with uh, two motifs, the amphora, as you see here, and the Pratt tablet, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment, when they share the same uh, medium. I was meant to go back to Italy to uh, an archaeological site with a team there in Oplantis. Oplantis is just uh, outside of uh, Pompeii, between Pompeii and Herculaneum. Um, with COVID, all of that was, of course, closed down. I would have had access to um, the real thing. Uh, I would have had access to the storage warehouses at Oplantis, uh, the uh, Aurea they were referred to. Nonetheless, here I am with uh, an online archive from the uh, University of Southampton in the UK. And so with the drawings and the 3D renderings of many different types of uh, Roman amphora, I settled on what's known as the Africana 3B. And I set to task to carve that in a block of um, Vermont Olympia white. And you can see my, my block here on the right with my, my, um, my templates, um, my radius, and then on the wall are my longitudinal templates, my horizons. <clears throat> and then trips back and forth to Bennington, Vermont, to the, uh, the churchyard of the old first congressional church. Uh, where this small tombstone, it's the, uh, the smallest one there on the left, um, the backside of, of this row of graves, uh, that small little stone is what's known as the Pratt tablet. Here it is again on the right. Uh, this one carved, obviously, in 1786. Um, and the reason that I've focused in on this particular Pratt tablet 
uh, is be because its, its uh, dimension and its motif is what has endured uh, through most of Vermont's um, marble industry, pick, picking up in the 19th century, right through to the middle of the 20th century, kind of just post-war, um, where this motif um, became ubiquitous with grave markers across all of New England. Um, so the rise of the Proctor family, for example, in Vermont with the um, cutting of marble, uh, this simple dimension, um, it's only an inch and a half thick and it's 20 and a half inches wide and 30 inches long. Um, you can see two, two slabs cut here um, in my studio uh, by a fellow carver in Proctor, Vermont, uh, Mr. Brent Wilson. Uh, that dimension is, uh, is, a, is a major part of, of the, the cycling of the marble industry in Vermont. So I, uh, like the amphora, I, um, I've done my, my best to recreate the original. Um, I've taken measurements and graphite rubbings from the, the Pratt tablet at, in Bennington, and, um, and I've recreated, recarved both the cherub and the, the text for Mr. John Pratt. Um, in that image on the left, if anyone can tell me what that small letter E above the letter Y um, means, what, what's, what is that a convention of in terms of, uh, you know, use of our language on a, on a tombstone, uh, please include that in the question and answer period because I haven't been able to find it in my research. Um, what's lovely about this early Pratt tablet, of course, is that, is that there was no real template. Um, there was no way of, uh, assuring that everything was going to be plumb and, and or perpendicular. Um, and so there's so much variation just in the text alone and certainly in all of the detail that's carved um, along the sides and, and throughout, throughout the, uh, the, the top piece there, um, just made for both um, a real challenge in my own work, but, but also this appreciation um, for an unknown carver um, who put this together in 16, uh, oh, sorry, in uh, 1768. And ultimately, how do I bring these two motifs together? So when it comes to the space of a gallery, I think of um, a certain type of environment or atmosphere. Um, I think of the physical connection between a, an 18th century motif and, and an ancient motif. So how does that Pratt tablet engage with the form of a Roman amphora? Uh, the physical connection I think is relevant um, simply through through the marble itself. They they share uh, in that Vermont marble, and then in the background, how might I secure an impression of that Pratt tablet? Again, through the use of the beeswax, understanding that the beeswax itself will be the uh, the copy that that endures. Um, I enjoy showcasing marble as a material. Um, I certainly enjoy working with it. Um, I also enjoy how a certain simplicity of, of this tombstone tablet um, is matched with, with physically the complexity of the amphora. The amphora is an ongoing compound curve um, and um, probably one of my more challenging forms to carve with, with any accuracy, um, but yet is, is less defined, is less um, kind of, uh, what's the word? Well, perhaps more generalized, oddly enough, whereas the Pratt tablet is, is completely specific, in this case, to the original to John Pratt himself. Um, so perhaps the ubiquity of the amphora, as I'm showing it here, um, is kind of the foreshadowing of how the Pratt tablet itself uh, became ubiquitous to the marble industry in, in Vermont. And I believe that might be my final image. Yes. Okay. So there we go. Well, I will say thank you, Bradley, for sharing with us, you know, the evolution of your artistic practice and, you know, deeper insights into what you were thinking and how all of these different projects built upon each other um, to create objects of empire. And for those of you who joined us uh, later in the program, uh, our webinar is recorded and will be posted on the BCA website. But now we'd love to turn our time to some questions. Oops, and I already have one. Okay, well, this 
This is uh, from Rene Bouchard and it's kind of more of a statement, but let me read it. it. I really respond to your work's ability to conjure ideas of imperialism, extraction, altercation, and continuity. Have you read Ariella Azule's Potential History on Learning Imperialism? She talks about the shutter of a camera as a metaphor for imperialism. Do you think your work aims to connect a shared or common world? Also, I live in Bennington and am familiar with the stone you reference. Great talk. Well, thank you. That's that is a uh, that's a pretty low, loaded question. I've got it up here. I have to go through it bit by bit. <laughs> um, I have not read uh, Azulay's potential history, uh, unlearning imperialism. Um, obviously, it is um, timely to do so, right? I think just in terms of um, uh, where we are in in. In North America, anyway, right, with respect to reconciliation, for one, right. So, um, but I haven't gone there because I'm I'm um, I'm a little bit wary, to be honest with you, um, in terms of how I might present certain elements or aspects of either imperialism or perhaps you know the reach of empire, uh, because I want to try to keep what I'm doing more specific to the motif and not necessarily the full kind of historical or cultural context of it, right? Because then, then I think I'd be running a bit thin with, with what I know and with, with how I might represent so much information. Um, I'm not a polit political activist, I don't think, in my work um, either. It's not who I am necessarily, um, if that were meant to be part of the question. Um, so do you think your work aims to connect a shared or common world? Um, sure. I think, I think in terms of, um, what we might look at historically, um, what, when I, when I can access some of, um, those historical spaces, uh, and, and, and the remains, the remnants of those spaces, um, typically I'm, I'm experiencing those spaces through the lens of the material that I'm enamored by, right? All of that stonework. But ultimately I'm also looking at, um, you know, the objects, the, the wares, the, um, the implements um, and everything relates to being human. Everything is of a certain scale. Everything is of a, of a, of a function typically. Um, and I don't tend to, I, I think we, we tend to not be that different than say a Roman citizen 2000 years ago, right? Um, the world around us has changed. Um, the, the, the tools, the technologies have changed. I don't think the humanity of it has changed that much, <laughs> right? So to me, a Roman amphora, um, has as much uh, relevance now, you know, say compared to um, you know the brown the, the brown uh, paper grocery bag that you would that you would bring your your groceries home in. You, you know what I mean? Like like there there's a I may, maybe I need to maybe I need to start to carve contemporary um, objects of ubiquity U ubiquitous objects in stone. I don't know. Um, and you live in Bennington, uh, so you know that that churchyard, which is an amazing place. Um, the thing I really enjoyed about visiting Bennington uh, and, and the churchyard there um, was that um, in that throughout that churchyard, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, Renee, certain headstones have a small sign or a small placard with an explanation as to who's either buried there or in kind of their their narrative as part of the the founding of Bennington. A, a lot of you know colonial. Um, histories um, shared by by a few families, and and so to kind of see those highlighted throughout that cemetery is a really wonderful way to experience that cemetery and the history of the place. Uh, and then once in a while, uh, a tombstone would be labeled um, the uh, the the person who carved that stone would be would be identified, um, and you know which is kind of nice to see too. And of course, you'd see these names of um, stone carvers, um, Italian names, Polish names, uh, what I would think to be uh, British or English names, you know, so so just kind of understanding from where in Europe, um, some of those colonial era, uh, and then later Victorian era uh, designs were, were actually coming from, you know, and um, it's, pretty, it's pretty nice. Now, with the Pratt tablet, of course, we don't know. It's anonymous. Um, and I like that. I like that anonymity and, and, I, and I enjoy how unassuming it is. It's this tiny little tombstone. It's one of the oldest. And then it's kind of surrounded by the later versions, you know, um, kind of reminds me for some reason of 
driving down the road and somebody in a Volkswagen rabbit from 1980 is driving towards you and you realize how, how modest it was, but it still got you there, right? It still got you from A to B kind of idea, you know? That's interesting. I, I have another question for you. Uh, this is from Jackie O'Brien and she asks, can you speak a little bit more about the sound element of your current work at BCA and its connection to the objects? Yes. Um, so that, that soundscape, uh, that composition, uh, musical composition is uh, in collaboration with um, actually with my, my brother-in-law in, uh, who lives in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Uh, he himself being a musician and a sound engineer. Um, and so uh, the collaboration was born out of his appreciation for sculpture and my appreciation for music, but, but I'm not a musician and he's not a sculptor. So, right, <laughs> we have to kind of combine our, 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 um, our methods. Um, for the installation though, um, um, I'm interested to, to see how I might affect the entirety of the space of the gallery. Um, I believe that uh, Vermont Olympia white marble with the lighting in the gallery has a very strong presence visually. It sparkles, you know, and it, and it has visual weight uh, for the most part. The cedar blocks upon which the marble is sitting is freshly cut. So that cedar is aromatic, uh, almost potentially caustic. It's, uh, it's, it's not necessarily a friendly uh, kind of um, off-gassing of sorts, but, but nonetheless, it's there. And then of course the beeswax is fully olfactory um, once, once it's kind of in there and, and warms up. So how do I take all of that visual information and all of that uh, olfactory information um, and then kind of, you know, in a way support what you might expect in that gallery experience with, with the actual soundscape of that space. And to me, the the sound score or the musical composition of, of, um, of performance art, certainly of film, um, adds so much emotion and um, adds, um, in, in, a, in an odd way, I guess it adds content to the show, even though you can't see it or smell it. <laughs> it's just that other layer of information. And so the particular composition is a, is a, um, it's a recording of an industrial machine um, from a, a metal workers uh, shop who, who lives um, not far from me here in Maine. Uh, it's, it's an industrial um, hammer that, that just is on all day um, when uh, this gentleman is working. And it's a, it's a fascinating, to me, it's a fascinating uh, kind of sound that, that is just part of his everyday life. And I wanted to kind of extract that as, a, as an example of someone who is on a daily basis, um, probably more industrious than, than most people I know. And, 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 and he has this backdrop of this rhythm. <laughs> and, I, and I wonder if it's that rhythm that almost keeps him going. Um, and so, so that's the beginning of that soundscape. Um, and, then, and then layered in and looped into that industrial machine is this musical composition. And, and a singular, a singular um, tone with the use of only uh, piano. Uh, as well. And, and just keeping things simple, but melodic, um, providing, um, I think your words actually described it best, Heather, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, writing about that component, mm -hmm. of the show, right? Um, maybe something a bit forlorn. I mean, we are looking at a headstone, we are looking at a remnant amphora, you know, like, how, how does a musical composition tie into uh, a sense of what it is we're looking at, but then, but then also allowing that music to build, um, as music can, uh, to bring the um, kind of spirit of the space through a little bit of a refrain, you know? And, and I have to ask, is this the first time that you've um, used sound within a sculptural installation? Uh, no, um, I've had uh, past exhibitions where um, either uh, like video projection, so, so initial film, um, converted to video, projected, and then, and then sound overlay to accompany the film. So I guess this is the first, you know, there's no moving image. Um, it's, it's just about the space and, and the objects. Mm -hmm. and, and someone has answered uh, your question, my question, as far as what the Y-E or Y-E oh, uh, or that? A is oh. obsolete English for the. 
So the stone reads May the 16th, 1768. And forgive me if I don't pronounce her name correctly, but I think it's Ankeny White. Oh, Ankeny White is a colleague of mine. Thank you, Ankeny. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> well, hey, who knew, who knew? And I could not find this. Uh, I was searching online, shame me. I should have gone to the archive or something. I haven't had time. Um, so, so the word the, well, that's interesting. Um, and I'm glad in a way that, the, that there wasn't the use of the word the in that stone because every time I would have to recarve the letter T, the letter H or the letter E, which are elsewhere, in today's mindset, they should all look the same. Mm -hmm. But in 1968, there was no template. It was all done by hand, and, uh, I, and they don't they don't look the same. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, I was I was starting to worry about that a little bit. So oh no, it's wonderful. And I think we have if this time for one more question. If there's anyone else who'd like to pose one before I go into my my thank yous. All right, all right. Well, we're we are at that time, and so. Thank you again, Bradley. And if you'll um, stay with me for a moment while I thank um, the people who helped bring this program together today, uh, in addition to you, our artists. Um, really, I'd like to also thank Colin Storrs, our curatorial assistant and gallery coordinator, who is the man behind the Zoom uh, screen, as well as uh, my collaborator in presenting these exhibitions, as well as the BCA communications team for their support in today's program. Exhibitions such as Objects of Empire would not be possible without the financial and in-kind support of our funders. And so special thank you uh, to Mescoma Bank, our presenters uh, for BCA's 2021 Year of Exhibitions, the National Endowment for the Arts and the Vermont Arts Council. And Objects of Empire is on view through February 5th here at the BCA Center in Burlington, Vermont. It's a quick trip if you're not in town. Um, and it's a beautiful place to come visit fall or winter. And you can visit us in person, or we hope to have um, the installation up uh, on a virtual view platform on our website within the coming one to two weeks. Um, so you can check it out as well. Although you've got to experience the soundscape, which we can't really duplicate in that platform. But thank you again, Bradley, so much um, for participating in our talk today. And uh, I really enjoyed working with you on this project. Um, even with that pandemic, we got it done. I was gonna say, Heather, it's been a pleasure because uh, it, it's for everybody we know, it's just been a heck of a year. And, um, mm -hmm. and this had its own needed kind of postponement, right? And, mm -hmm. and then, but then also I, I can't imagine how you have to kind of keep Keep it all going and uh, there's so many moving parts and having been there just two weeks ago for the installation just to, to see how much is actually going on with correct me here four or five gallery spaces overall mm -hmm. and so many different bodies of work um you know artists aren't typically the most um easy people to work with right so you know <laughs> you you've, been, to, you've been wonderful you've actually, 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 all do, the artists have <laughs> it's been it's been it's been great and uh, and just getting up there and to kind of um uh, you know, just to get on the road and, and to um, experience a little bit of Vermont. It's been really, really lovely. So thank you. Well, we're thrilled to, to be able to present this exhibition to Vermont and our artist community. Thank you again. Thank you everyone for joining us today and uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.